Uh, I'm Dennis Warwood. I'm from Emory County. I live in Farron. How many know where Farron is? How many don't know where Farron is? Okay. Farron is right between Clawson and Moore. <laughs> All right. So how many still don't know? I'm about 45 miles southeast of Price. If you went to Manti and flew straight over the mountain, over the Wasatch Plateau, you'd end up in Farron. So it's east central Utah. I've been the extension agent down there for 31 years now. And uh, I do, I, my training is in horticulture, but I do a little bit of everything. Yesterday I taught two classes on how to uh, fit pigs for show. So if you want, <laughs> I've got those slides with me if you want to see it. Anyway, we're going to cover some irrigation and we're going to uh, kind of a flyover and hit everything from soup to nuts. Now, who do we have in here? Your nursery people or, la or landscape maintenance folks? Okay, some of this is going to be very basic to you. Some of it you'll uh, might be new. Let's see. Which one do I push? The bottom one? The right one. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about water. What's the chemical formula for water? H2O, so we've got two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, and be, because of the way the molecule is built, it looks a little bit like Mickey Mouse ears. The hydrogen atoms are, are shifted toward one end of the oxygen atom, and because of that, we have a slight positive and a slight negative charge on water molecule, and this is really handy because most of the properties that make water so useful are because of this uh, slight polarity that each molecule has. It means that water will stick to other water molecules and it will also stick to other surfaces. So we have cohesion where water sticks to itself and if you're really bored here you can do this at your table just uh, get some water in a glass and and when you get it full carefully add a little bit more and you can actually pile the water up over the glass and you've also seen uh, things uh, like that on the right where you have water beaded up on a waxy surface, in this case a leaf surface, it could be the hood of your car. But that's because of those polar those, uh, that little polarity that the molecule has. Water will also stick to other things and that's called adhesion. So here they've stuck a toothpick in and you can see the water climbing up there. That's not because it's splashed, the water is actually attracted there. And you've seen that if you've gone to the doctor's office and they've drawn blood, they've poked your finger and stuck that pipette on, it climbs up there real fast. That's, that's an important uh, property of water because it allows it to move around in plants. Okay, uh, I've got a demonstration for osmosis. and I've got two carrots. We're going to pick on you guys because you sat close to the front of the room. Okay, <laughs> they were the last ones. You must have come late, huh? <laughs> All right, I've got two carrots. I bought them yesterday. They've both been in water since 10 o'clock last night. So I want you to try to break this one. Okay, fairly crisp. Now try this one. Okay, okay. You can see that one you could almost tie a knot in. And uh, if you trust me, lick your fingers and see what, what's on there. Roundup? No. no. <laughs> what a, salt. salt. Okay. Osmosis is basically the property that water will naturally move across a membrane from an area of lower salt or soluble stuff uh, concentration to an area of higher concentration. So in this case, I put salt in this container and the water went out of the carrot because the water outside was saltier, had more stuff dissolved in it than the, in, the sap on the inside of the carrot. The other one was pure water and so the, the, the carrot actually absorbed some of that. So it, in our plants they're accumulating salts if you will, they're picking up fertilizer elements and then they have other stuff dissolved in there, the sugars that the plant naturally produces. The bottom line is that water naturally moves into the root because the inside of the plant is saltier than the outside of the plant. Now do any of you deal with saline or salty soils at all? Okay, some of you do. Probably not to the extent that I do. Have you been to Emory County? We have what we call summer snow and it's this big, I mean it looks like miniature salt flats and some of you if you're 
up in uh, West Salt Lake or out there that direction, you might have experience with it as well. But if you have a customer or a situation where uh, salts are hindering or stopping plant growth, it's because of this osmosis business. If the soil is saltier than the plant root, it cannot take up water. So if a customer buys extra fertilizer, puts on too much manure and it gets burned, it's because of, uh, largely because of osmosis. The plant literally has drought stress because it can't take the water up. Now, how do you get rid of salt? Okay, water. Salt's a hitchhiker. It will go wherever the water goes. And so, if we have a, a situation like the one on the right there, uh, the first thing I would do is see if there's a water table contributing to that. And in Emory County, a lot of the situation is there's a, a shallow water table, water is wicking to the surface and evaporating, and it leaves the, the dissolved salts behind. First thing you have to do is lower the water table through drainage, and then I can apply extra water. If it's a man-made situation where they've added extra fertilizer, or they've put on uh, too much manure, then it's simply a matter of watering. Okay, so here's how it works then. The water moves into the plant largely through osmosis, that actually creates some pressure because it's, it's packing water in there. But then as water evaporates from the leaf surface, then it pulls the water up. And since the water has the ability to stick together, and it also has the ability to stick to the xylem vessels within the plant, we can get an unbroken column of water from the roots clear to the top of a redwood tree, which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. If you tried to do that with a drinking straw that was uh, 300 feet tall, I'd suggest you probably would have a little trouble. But uh, because of water's properties, we can hold that column of water inside the plants. And there are other structures in the plant that help, but we don't get vapor lock typically. All right, why do they need water? Uh, photosynthesis, take water, carbon dioxide, sun's energy, uh, is then converted into a chemical form which is sugar and oxygen is the byproduct. Where does the oxygen come from? Comes, actually, the water that's, the oxygen that's discharged by the plant comes from the water molecule. The, the plant in photosynthesis chops the hydrogens off, attaches them to the carbon dioxide, so uh, the, it's actually cleaving water molecules in half. So that's one thing that's going on, and that's without that, all life on Earth would uh, end. Now, the plants use the sugar, they make other things, starches, cellulose, etc. How many of you have a wood stove? None of you do. Oh, okay, you do. You must live outside of the Wasatch Front where you can still burn wood. <laughs> all right, here's what I invite you to do. One of these cold nights, put some logs on the fire or in the stove, lay down beside it, and uh, close your eyes and feel the heat on your back and that's what that is is sunshine that's been stored by the plant through photosynthesis if you have a coal stove that's ancient sunshine because that's ancient plant stuff but the heat and the light generated when we burn things is the energy the sunshine coming back out uh, water helps plants hold their their shape so you've seen plants wilt uh, it moves nutrients around and, and uh, minerals and uh, other fertilizers, and it's needed for cell growth. So plant growth is hydraulic. This is an illustration of a root. So right down here on the root tip, there's a meristem where cell division is taking place. We've got a cap that's generated that's kind of a cow catcher as the, the root pushes itself through the soil. This sloughs off and is replaced. But these new cells out here, if you notice, are pretty small. And then it says the zone of elongation, they're actually pumped full of water. And as the cells enlarge, that, that enlargement is what drives the root through the soil. And it's the same with shoot tips or uh, girth diameter or, diameter or the size of fruit. When I was in graduate school, I did a study of orchard irrigation where we used uh, mini sprinklers to micro sprinklers to apply different amounts of water to peach trees. And what we found with the peaches was the, the trees that received the least amount of water 
had the smallest fruit and the sweetest fruit. The, the ones that got the most amount of water had the biggest fruit, but it had a little less sugar in it than the little ones. And the, the reason was simply the plant basically put the same amount of sugar into every fruit. The thing that varied was the amount of water we pumped in. So if you made Kool-Aid and added a gallon of water instead of two quarts, it would be less sweet than the regular Kool-Aid. And that's, that's what happens with plants. Cell division takes place, and then it pumps the cells full of water, makes the fruit bigger, makes the shoots longer, makes the roots go through the soil. So if we don't have water, then the plants can't grow. And uh, the other thing that's hydraulic is on the leaf, we have to get the, the carbon dioxide in and the oxygen out. It's got the stomata, and they're hydraulic. So when there's plenty of water, the plant uh, pumps those, those guard cells full, and they open up, and if it's short of water, they slam shut. They wilt, essentially, and the plant can't conduct photosynthesis like it would like to. All right, so questions about... You just had a whole uh, semester of, of botany right there. <laughs> uh, okay, if we take the evaporation from the soil surface and the water that goes through the plant then that's called evapotranspiration or consumptive use. That's how much water needs to be applied to keep the plant growing the way we want it to. So I pulled some uh, information. I picked, picked Pleasant Grove because it, uh, it was close by. Uh, anybody here from Pleasant Grove? Okay, now you know how much water you need to put on. Uh, what I want you to notice, uh, I, orchard water use, and this is calculated from climatic data, so this is an average figure on a given year, it might be different, but notice in April it starts, uh, which is the highest month there? July, and then it tapers off again. Same thing with turf, they start in March with the turf, so you Pleasant Grove Ians, Ox, what do you call yourselves in Pleasant Grove? Vikings? Okay, whatever, a Viking. They, uh, they like to grow their lawn a little earlier than they start their fruit trees, but that's when the, the turf activates. And you can see garden water use. Bottom line here is obviously water use changes through the season. And if you're advising customers or if you're managing a landscape, if you're wanting to save water, you need to adjust your irrigation to match what the plant is using. Okay, factors affecting how much the plant uses. Obviously weather, temperature, humidity, wind, sunshine, and then the plant size and the growth stage. So uh, say in a vegetable garden, at certain growth stages, it's more critical that you have adequate water than others. For example, if, uh, if I don't have enough water on a, on a corn plant, then uh, when it's tasseling, I'll probably have ears that have uh, maybe some gaps in the kernels because uh, a lot of you are probably aware for that when that pollen falls from the uh, tassel down onto the silk of the ear, that that minuscule little pollen grain has to germinate and grow a tube that goes the length of the corn silk and then can fertilize the ovule that's down there on the ear, which is pretty miraculous when you consider a microscopic uh, particle like a pollen grain. If there's not enough water, it can't do that. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit, that's the plant part, we're going to talk a little bit about soil. So soil contains the mineral parts, sand, silt, and clay has air in it, hopefully has water, organic matter, living organisms. So what are some of the living organisms in soil? Earthworms, okay, nematodes, springtails, uh, bacteria, fungi. This is the difference between this group and an Emory County group. In Emory County, they would say prairie dogs, badgers, <laughs> coal miners, you know, okay. All right. Okay, I want to talk, I want to zero in on that mineral part, the sand, silt, and clay. So the difference between sand, silt, and clay is particle size. So if that larger disk was a sand grain, the smaller one would be a silt particle, and the tiny one is clay. So. If I had a basketball representing a uh, sand particle, silt might be baseball size and clay would be the size of a BB. 
And so those three things determine your soil texture. So if you send a soil sample to a lab and they come back and they have a soil texture, uh, it's a silty clay loam or it's a sandy clay or whatever, what they've done is mix that up in some kind of a blender and then put it in a beaker that's graduated and, and after a few seconds they measure how much stuff has fallen out of solution and after another period of time they measure again and then the first stuff that falls out is the big stuff, that's the sand, the next stuff is the silt, the last stuff that stays in suspension is the clay and then they come up with a percentage so if I've got 40% uh, sand and 20% clay that means I've got 40% silt and that makes it a loam soil. So the term loam has nothing to do with organic matter or anything like that. It's simply the proportion of those particles. Okay, who cares? Well, we care because the texture determines how much water I can hold in that particular soil. And so, uh, you'll notice a sandy soil will hold about four tenths of an inch per foot and you get up into some of these that have more silt and clay in them and you're up around two inches per foot. That's how much water they'll hold. And the reason is because of the size of the particles and the size of the pore spaces that are naturally in there, that determines how much uh, surface area I've got for those water molecules to cling to and also how easy it is for the water to move around in the soil. So if I were going to again use the scale, so basically they've got about that much clay right over the top of bedrock. And so they even have trouble irrigating the, the turf areas. They have, they, it's really a challenge to get the water in and you have to water pretty often because you just don't have much soil. And so I said to him, how did you plant these trees? And I was fortunate that the custodian was the original one he said, we used a bar. So they got down into the shale and they chipped out a hole. Okay, can you see what probably happened to those trees? They, they were growing in a pot that was the size of the planting hole and they did fairly well when they were small. Now they're getting some size to them and they were root bound. And uh, they also probably had some drainage problems because the water wouldn't move through there. So, uh, well, just stare at this until you've got it memorized then. The um, with the Green River? I said, uh, dig a bigger hole and plan on replacing your trees every 15 years. I, I mean, or else, uh, I mean, really, you can't grow big plants without soil. You've got to have a bigger container. And so they either do some major excavation or they go with a different plant that doesn't need that much root zone. Do any, none of you have anything like that? Maybe. On top of that, the Manco Shale is salty. So other than being salty and shallow and straight clay, it's pretty good soil. So when we're scheduling irrigation, then if we know how much, how big our, our reservoir is because of texture and the, soil and the rooting depth, and we know how much water we're applying, then if we can come up with some kind of an estimate of how much the plants are using, then we can manage irrigation. Now, uh, I've got a slide. Oh, there we go. This is how it works. Uh, after you've irrigated, the, these dark things are the different sand, silt, and clay and organic matter uh, molecules. Uh, I, I irrigate and, and everything is saturated initially, so all the pore spaces are full. Now, we can't have that permanently because the plants will die because they, don't have, they need oxygen in the root zone. But after, after a few hours, then gravity has pulled on that water and drawn it down, and then uh, we have a condition that's called field capacity. And what I would have then are, uh, is a, a film of water around each of these particles. And then evaporation starts to occur. There's weather data and they are, they're automatic. Uh, uh, she's, the question is whether she should cycle them on and off or just put it all on at once. And I think it depends on your situation in the soil. If I had a really tight soil that simply wouldn't take the water that fast, or if I was working on a slope, I would probably cycle it. And that's what the Green River folks had to do with their turf. The water went in so slowly that they would only water for a few minutes and then they had to go to the next uh, circuit and the next and the next and then come back. And they may have to do that 
three or four times to get on the right amount of water. So if I've got a slope or if I've got fairly tight soil, if I'm getting run off and wasting water, then I'm going to um, cycle it. If, if my soil will take it, if I had a sandy soil, then just put it on and shut, it, shut the system down. Okay, we've talked about this. Okay, there's some rooting depths. Uh, there's the tree roots like Larry showed you, and most of them are closer to the one on the right. If, if you want, you can feel the soil to estimate it. You can measure evaporation using a pan or, or weather data. Uh, I worked on a research farm where we had an evaporation pan and we had a coefficient. We would multiply daily evaporation, uh, evaporation and come up with a, an evapotranspiration figure. And it was really high until we figured out that the, the farm manager had a St. Bernard that was drinking out of the pan. <laughs> okay. So you got to watch that. But a lot of, there, there are a lot of services now that will use data to, uh, to provide weather data for you and even calculate ET for you. Okay, some visual signs. Uh, if you walk across the lawn and if your footprints don't disappear within a certain amount of time, then it's probably dry. You've seen that bluish green or, green or grayish cast or purplish cast that grass gets when it's starting to get thirsty, and it typically will show up in the spots that are under irrigated. You can stick a screwdriver in, uh, and the, water, the screwdriver will penetrate as deep as the water has gone. That's another way to see if you're getting water down into the soil. If you're in a garden situation, the one on the left is blossom end rot. That's a calcium deficiency. Our soils are full of calcium. You're, you're farming or gardening on a giant tum, basically. It's calcium carbonate is probably one of the most abundant elements in your soil. So there's plenty of calcium. If you get this calcium deficiency symptom, it means that something interrupted the flow of sap from the root to the fruit. And that's usually irregular irrigation. Or if you get potatoes that look like Richard Nixon's profile, that means they started to grow and, and uh, stopped growing when they got dry, started again. So there's, uh, there's various uh, symptoms, uh, leaf scorch on a looks like an elm leaf on the left, uh, corn rolling its leaves on the right. Uh, too much water, which happens fairly regularly. Uh, chlorosis, so I, uh, over irrigation induced iron chlorosis, that yellowing. Uh, too much water, your tree dies. Now the interesting thing about this is the symptom is similar to drought stress because the roots die. The plant can't move water like it needs to. And so it gives a drought stress symptom, but it's actually too much water, you've killed the root. How much time we got? We about done? Oh yeah, we were way done. Okay. There's the catch cans. Let me just close with this. If you're, this year we may be short of water. I, the last time I snuck to check the snow tail, we were around 70 to 80 percent the, the, on our kind of statewide. Um, I've seen it worse, but uh, if you end up short of water this year and have to do some things, there are three w basic ways to conserve water. First is to repair leaks. So if I've got a leaky tap, if I've got a bad valve, if I've got sprinklers that don't work right, if the sprinklers are not aimed right and I'm spraying pavement, any of these things are leaks. And the nice thing about that is when you fix that, you don't have to worry about it anymore. If you've got a leaky pipe, you fix it, you've saved water automatically. Now you can install water saving devices, so that would be anything from a low flow shower head to a drip system to a Xeriscape. A Xeriscape is basically a water saving device. The thing about these is they don't actually, they don't automatically save water, they simply make it harder to waste water. So if I install a low flow sh fl shower head and then stand in the shower till the water, the, the water heater is empty, I haven't saved any water. And you can waste water with a drip system. So it requires management. And the third one is better management. And this is often the most cost effective. And I'll give you an example. I was elected to the Fair and City Council in 1990, took office in the spring of 91, which was really dry. And our stream flow forecast told us that we would not be able to irrigate landscapes at all. Now, Farron has a really Cadillac a secondary irrigation system. I have an inch and a half secondary untreated irrigation water service at my yard with about 80 pounds of pressure and I pay 50 bucks a year for it. 
I mean, and it's clean water. It's basically untreated culinary. It's a nice system, but we didn't have any water to put into it. And so the city council held a town meeting. We had to hold it in the elementary school gymnasium because everybody in town was there. And we had to tell these people that they could not water their lawns at all that year. Um, I'll tell you a couple of rules of water real quickly I learned. I was over water for seven years on, in, on the city council, and I was also over planning and zoning. So if I didn't offend people with water, I offended them through zoning. <laughs> but um, two rules. One is that water shortage will bring out the best in most people and the worst in others. The other rule I learned is that water that shows up in your basement that doesn't belong to anybody. So if you wake up one morning and, and go downstairs and there's a foot of standing water in your basement, then happy day, that's your water. The city's not going to claim it. The, the local canal company will not claim it. You can file on that water and nobody will contest it. It's yours. Anyway, I was talking about management. When we, when we held that public meeting and told them that they could not water outside, we'd already anticipated that some would try to sneak culinary water. And so we had to bump up the overage fee for culinary and we put it like at $25 a thousand, and a thousand gallons won't go very far in a landscape. What do you think happened to culinary water use the next day in Farron? It dropped 40% overnight through that third one, better management. So if we're more careful, if we, if we think about what we're doing, we can save a lot of water. All right, um, we're out of time. I, I'm keeping you from your break. Are there any questions? Okay, best time of day, and Larry might be able to chip in on this. Uh, typically, the, the municipalities will tell people they have to water during the cooler hours, night or, or uh, early morning or evening. And the theory is that they're, most of them are sprinkling and they're going to have less evaporation, and that may be true. I think, honestly, a lot of municipalities do that because the, the daytime hours are the time when their employees are on shift and they can go around and police it as much as anything. Now, was it you, Larry, that talked about research where they'd actually, there was less evaporation because they'd cooled the soil surface, or was that somebody else? It wasn't you. I would, I would try to do it when it's cool and try to do it when it's not windy. And in Emory County, that means you'll probably never water at all, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, if you can think about things that would reduce evaporation, uh, we always would prefer to irrigate like a turf rather than irrigating a little bit every day. I try to put on an inch and then go until it needs to be irrigated again.